Well, thanks very much, Darcy, for those kind words. And let's just do a uh, check whether you can actually hear me okay in the back. That sounds like a lot of thumbs up. So, <laughs> any thumbs down? No. Great. Okay, just raise your hand if it ceases to be audible. Um, I want to thank Darcy for those very kind words. And thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here to speak at Smith. I'd like to thank Carrie Baker, as well as Darcy, Lorraine Hedger, Rachel Lappin, who's a volunteer at uh, Shibden Anne's House in Halifax and who's helped me immeasurably, and my great niece, uh, Jo, at the, towards the back, uh, who's given us a great, brilliant tour of Smith in the snow. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much. <laughs> so tonight our trigger is Gentleman Jack, which some of you have watched. Hands up with anybody who's watched an episode or two. <laughs> right. Hands up. Hands up anybody who's watched the whole eight episodes. <laughs> well, don't worry. Don't worry if you haven't had a chance to put your hand up, because I will just cover a little bit of ground um, beforehand. But what you will know if you have watched even just one episode is the genius behind this is the genius scriptwriter Sally Wainwright. Mm -hmm. But tonight, our focus is not the TV drama, but how, sorry, <laughs> sorry, I personally find history just infinitely uh, fascinating. So our focus tonight isn't the television drama, but how generations of authors and editors have written about Anne and her diary since her death in 1840. So, we're going to look at that over a period of nearly two centuries, and I'm going to analyse it in the context of LGBT history in the UK. Does that sound all right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Great. So our question to start off with is, how do you write about a woman who's already written a four, or maybe is it five, million word diary? Tonight I'm going to present to you some short readings from Manchester's own writings. Um, so most of you have seen Gentleman Jack, but who was the real Anne Lister? Here's a suggestion of some of the things. Yes, she was a scholar. Yes, she was quite academic. At a time when no women could go to university, she was a linguist. Um, she had languages. She was a, a, a prominent scientist. She was a landowner. She inherited Shipton Estate from her uncle in 1826. A businesswoman, developed her own coal mines in the 1830s. A traveller, climbed Big Merle in 1838, the highest peak in the French Pyrenees, and then set off to Russia in 1839. Her diaries four, maybe five million words long, a one-sixth of written is in her private code, secret code. She lived a lesbian life, and she recorded it all in kind of detail. And since then, and particularly over the last few years, she's inspired books, films, and now tours to Halifax and to Shipton. Everyone okay so far? Right, so let's locate ourselves. Anyone here been to Halifax? Oh, brilliant. Great, the rest of you must come. Anyone been to Shipton? Oh, fantastic. Thank you, all four of you. Five of you. Um, here is John Horner's uh, drawing of Shipton, 1835, so very much the focus of the period we're looking at. And it helps us imagine Anne's home. It is rather pastoralised, there's not a single industrial uh, chimney sticking up its smoke, um, and Halifax itself was very rapidly industrialising by, by 1835, the date of this drawing. As you know, Anne Lister had inherited Shipton's ancient acres in 1826 on the death of her uncle James. And if you visit it now, it will look slightly different. So where was Halifax? I think the vast majority of the people in this room aren't terribly sure. Would that be fair to say? <laughs> yeah. Somewhere in England. Yeah. Well, here we are in Halifax. Here we have on the left Halifax itself. And you can see uh, the Peace, Peace Hall um, and the parish church. Can you see OK? <laughs> Going slightly up. Uh, to the right, there's Shibden Hall and Shibden Hall Estate. Then we go 
further right, that is east, past Hipperhome to Lightcliffe and the Crownest Estate, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Tonight, we want to start our historical journey with a quick look at Anglister's four, or is it five million word diaries, which are a challenge to decipher and a challenge to, to uh, transcribe almost illegible handwriting and one sixth is in code. Do you feel ready to have a look at a page? Mm -hmm. yeah. You're brave. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the right time to take you painstakingly through day by day, but you'll notice that Anne Lister writes the date, the year at the top of the page, and the month, um, and then the day and the date down the left-hand margin of these two pages. And I've chosen May 1832 because that is, as you know from uh, Gentleman Jack, or you might know from Gentleman Jack, that this is exactly when Anne Lister returns to Shipton. She's left Hastings, where she'd been in southern England, betrayed yet again by yet one more women's marriage plans. <laughs> Remember, fear how God, tears. And this is when... <laughs> When Gen Gentleman Jack and Nature's Domain, which we'll talk about in a, a moment, open. Um, and here is Anne Lister herself. It was a quiet homecoming, that's what she wanted. Uh, of the Lister family, her immediate Lister family there, she didn't get on terribly well with her sister, nor with her uh, old soldier father. But her aunt, Aunt Anne, had, a, as you'll know from Gentleman Jack, had a very close, emotional, empathetic uh, bond. Anne still felt restless. She didn't have the money that she felt she was entitled to. And she pondered and debated. But soon, very soon, because Anne Lister never wasted time, she decided she must reinvent herself. She would no longer just be the high society flirt and European traveller of the past. But she would become Anne Lister. <coughs> inheritor of Shipton's Ancient Acres and now a member of the landed gentry, albeit minor landed gentry. She had power and authority and what she needed was a wife. <laughs> <laughs> who's, read, who's read Pride and Prejudice here? Oh, brilliant. What a tribute to Smith. So who can remember the opening lines of Pride and Prejudice? Yeah, 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 exactly. I'm just going to adapt, if I may, if you'll give me permission, to adapt Jane Austen to uh, Alistair. So I'm going to slightly adapt it. It is a truth, universally acknowledged, that a single woman in need of a good fortune must be in need of a wife. <laughs> It is a truth, universally acknowledged, that a single woman in need of a good fortune must be in need of a wife. And that's what we need to hang on to. And as you know from Gentleman Jack, Anne Lister very soon is reacquainted with uh, Anne Walker, heiress to half the Cronest estate. She's a wealthy woman, about 12 years younger than Anne, but very isolated and with none of her high education. And here is Cronest Estate. And you can immediately see that it's grander than Shipton, it's glass houses, and to the left there's a little sort of folly, um, just grander and a larger estate. And as you know from Gentleman Jack, Anne Lister wastes not too much time conducting her wooing in the moss hut, or if you want to speak French, and I know some people here do speak French, show me a moss hut. Um, and that's where the seduction takes place. The relationship develops, as you know from Gentleman Jack or what you've read, and 1834, February, there's a betrothal ceremony, an exchange of rings. And eventually, our union, uh, our marriage, is to be sanctified in church in York with a sacrament. And let's have a look at that page. And has anyone read Female Fortune or got a copy? Thank you. <laughs> um, this is on page 100. And again, it's one of the most uh, quoted uh, pieces of my uh, work on Sunday, the 30th of March, 1834, they're in York. She goes into code immediately. <laughs> Three kisses better to her than to me. 
at Goodrum Gate Church, an ancient church quite near the York Minster, at 10.35 in the morning. Miss Walker and I and Thomas, Thomas being a servant because no respectable elite women like Anne Walker and Alista would carry their own Bible and prayer books to church on their own and be accompanied by a servant. Miss Walker and I and Thomas stayed at the sacrament and then back into the code at the end of the day. The first time I ever joined Miss Walker in my prayers, I had prayed that our union might be happy. She had not thought of doing as much for me. She had not thought of doing as much for me. And I'm afraid it is a sad, brief, and sobering end to that day. So that's where Gentleman Jack Series 1 ends. And what we'll probably see in Series 2, but who can tell us yet. And Walker then moves into Shipton Hall with Anne Lister. And do we get a picture of domestic harmony? Well, I'll leave you to read about that. Um, but <laughs> one of the things they do in the evening, and this is to be expected of two women who've inherited estates, Shipton Hall and Cronus Estate, will reading becomes the language of love. <laughs> of course it does. They own property. They own land. Will reading becomes the language of love of an evening in Shipton and redrafting their wills, which are complex documents of 30 or 40 pages each, giving each other a life interest in the, uh, in the, in the other woman's estate. They also travel, as you know, they go to the Pyrenees in 1838 and climb Big Merle, or Anne Lister does, and 1839 they set off together for Russia, where it might have been expected that uh, Anne Walker would be the first to uh, die, but in fact it was Anne Lister who predeceased Anne Walker in 1840. So that's just a brief taste of the diaries writing and the challenge that it, they present. And now I want to have a look broadly at how different editors and authors have selected and written about Anne Lister. Um, and I want to place them in their LGBT historical context, without which I think we can't really understand it. And I think you'll, everybody doing swag classes will take that. So here back we are at Shibden and the uh, Horner drawing. The diaries end in 1840, as you know, they end very abruptly with Anne's uh, ill health and death quite shortly afterwards in Western Georgia, which is then one of the most inaccessible places in uh, Europe and beyond. And Walker was left with the unenviable task of bringing the coffin back from Western Georgia via Russia back for burial in Halifax Minster. Uh, she had two servants, at least two servants with her at any time, but it was not an easy task. It was a, a mournful and tragic task. And I'm, Walker's life was very troubled. I'm sorry, I'm not going to go into details here, um, but she died in 1854. Um, and that melodramatic transmission story, sorry, of uh, what happened to the diaries after Anderson's death in Western Georgia in 1840 uh, is told in presenting the, the past. It was a melodramatic transmission story. Everybody okay for sound? Um, which are telling and presenting the past. And a lot of local stories about this extraordinary woman, Anne Lister, who lived in Shibden Hall and died in Russia and did something. The first writer to write about um, Anne Lister after her death, um, after the death of Anne Walker in 1854, um, and John Lister's family, that's the indirect descendants of Anne Lister, the nearest indirect descendants, moves into Shipton Hall. The first writer is Rosa Kettle, and it's a novel called The Mistress of Langdale Hall, A Romance of the West Riding, that's the West Riding of Yorkshire. She'd been a visitor at Shipton, so she picked up on these local stories. And I just quote one little line from it. She never intended to marry. No man would ever lord it over her in Langdale. 
She never intended to marry. No man would ever lord it over her at Langdale. We get a glimpse of Anne Lister and her authority and her mindset, but no more. Because, of course, this is a mid-Victorian novel, and there is no hint at all, of course, that Anne Lister was a lesbian. No hint whatsoever, uh, nor use of that word. So here is an Anne Lister timeline from 1840 to 1892 and we're viewing it through the lens of LGBT history. I have to be honest and uh, say I'm not an LGBT historian, and other people will be better versed in this room than I. I'm certainly not up to date with the latest LGBT theory, so bear with me. But I will examine that history through the lens of Anne Lister and her diaries. The next writer is, of course, the young John Lister, the son of the John Lister who inherited. He's scholarly, uh, academic. He published in the uh, Halifax Guardian, the local paper, a series of selections from the diaries on social and political life in Halifax. And he started in 1887, and he ended in 1892, and it was once a week. That's a lot of writing, a lot of uh, selections. What does he open with? He's interested in politics. He opens with the 1837 election, general election. And Lister and Walker are living together at Shibden. What do they do? They doorstep their tenants. Of course they doorstep their tenants because they must support the Tory that is conservative political interest and they must defeat the Whigs, if at all possible, what we call liberals. They must defeat the Whigs. Can women vote then in England? No, of course they can't. They can't vote at all. Does that matter? No, it doesn't. Because why doesn't it matter? Because there's no secret ballot yet. So every single uh, tenth vote will be recorded in a polling book um, that the Anne Lister and Anne Walker could look at. So they could doorstep to their heart's content, pretty much. OK? <laughs> um, around 1892, um, Arthur... Uh, John Lister was working with a fellow antiquarian called Arthur Burrell, who was a schoolmaster at Bradford Grammar, and they managed to crack the code. And I will, if I may, uh, read um, from Presenting the Past, um, and it's, I think, the most quoted section of anything I've ever written about Anne Lister. So this is Burrell reflecting back to a period which I think was 1892. Up to that time, we knew nothing of the cipher alpha alphabet, the coded alphabet, the code. I distinctly remember taking a volume back to Shipton and telling Mr. Lister, John Lister, that I was certain of two letters, H and E, and I asked him if there was any likelihood that a further clue could be found. We then examined one of the boxes behind the panels at Shipton, secret panels behind the at Shipton, and halfway down the collection of deeds, and there were a lot of estate papers, there were Anne Lister's diaries, whole mass of papers, we found us on a scrap of paper these words, in God is my <coughs> in code. We at once saw that the word must be hope, and the H and the E corresponded to my guess. The word hope was in secret code. With these four letters almost certain, we began at very late at night to find the remaining clues. We finished at two o'clock in the morning. The part written in code turned out after examination to be entirely unpublishable. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lester was distressed, but he refused to take my advice, which was he should burn all 26 volumes. He was, as you know, an antiquarian. And my suggestion seems sacrilege, which perhaps it was. And then Arthur Burrell goes on in his retrospective reflections on this moment, probably in 1892, that the coded sections presented an intimate account of homosexual practices amongst Miss Lister and her many friends. And then Burrell added, this very unsavoury document contained evidence that these friendships made were criminal. <laughs> So why was it so shocking? Why could it be criminal? Well, we need to look at LGBT history in the UK, which is obviously different from America. So the context, and you may have covered this in, in your courses, is the 1885 Criminal Law Amendment Act. Anyone come across it? Please do look out for it. 
Please look out for it. The Criminal Law Amendment Act in 1885. And what this law did was to make all homosexual acts totally illegal. They'd been illegal before, but this is tightening the law and with harsher punishment. And the criminal law became really clamping down on male homosexuality. It got known as the Blackmailers Charter. Of course it did, because it was perfect material for blackmail. And you probably heard of Oscar Wilde. Yes, of course you have and his trials in 1895. So that's the context. There were men up in court for this. But it didn't affect lesbians. It didn't affect women. So why worry? Because sex between women was silenced. This was a context in which the criminal law as it affected men had effect culturally and socially on the behavior of women. Women, sex between women was silenced as abnormal, unspeakable. Lesbianism, we have to understand this cultural context of what was around the Criminal Law Amendment Act. And this is where LGBT street in the UK becomes so important. So our final line, the diaries around 1892, and that's what I think it most probably was, were put back behind the panels at Shipton. And there's a further layer of, of, if you like, tragedy, because John Lister himself was very probably homosexual. And has anybody been to Shipton? Yes, one or two people. I don't know whether you noted that photograph of John Lister. He's standing at the entrance to Shipton. He's a grown man, um, probably an oldish man by then, with like, some antiquarians. And I think Rachel would bear me out that he looks very, very despondent. He looks very, you know, it is not a good time to be a gay man. It is just awful. Um, and a 40 year silence uh, followed up until his death in 1933. So could it get any worse in the UK? Could it get any worse for uh, homosexuals? Well, yes, it could, and certainly for women. Because 30 years later, in 1921, um, and I don't think anyone in this room will probably know this. Anybody come across the 1921 attempted legislation? It's only just been discovered. 1921, a little known attempt in Parliament to extend the Criminal Law Amendment Act to women. Um, to criminalise sex as gross indecency between women. And as you know, um, 1921 was three years, just three years after women over 30 or most women over 30, got the vote in England after a very long and bitter suffrage struggle. So feminist campaigners thought we've won at least part of the battle um, and began to think about entering professions or thinking about equal pay eventually. And uh, possibly there was an uh, increasing amount, number of lesbians. Lesbian. MPs who were debating this uh, clause to the Criminal Law Amendment Act began to ask, will anyone's marriage be safe? That's what they feared. And this attempt to legislate against women soon fell because knowledge is fatal. To put something in the criminal law, you need to be explicit about it. You can't be half-hearted about murder. You can't be half-hearted about theft. Um, you've got to spell it out. This is what it means. This is the penalty. And they decided that knowledge was fatal. And their attempt to legislate against lesbian relate, sexual relations fell quite quickly. But again, I think even though women were still not touched by the law, uh, there was this context of cultural silencing. So let's look at some of these dates. 1921 we've looked at, and 1928, which I think some of you have come across well of known as, yeah, there's quite a lot of nods, um, Radcliffe Hall's novel, uh, Prosecution and Ban. So we can see that in the context of after the 1921 attempt and the sort of cultural silencing. 1933, the death of John Lister, the last Lister in Shipton Hall. And Shipton Hall now fell to, uh, it was owned by Halifax Borough, the local authority. So the task of sorting out the vast number of papers at Shipton, including the Amnesty Diaries and the letters and everything, fell to the 
Halifax Borough librarian, who was called Edward Green, and he deputed his young daughter, Muriel, Muriel Green, who was trained to be a librarian, to uh, sort and list the papers. So she enters Shipton Hall, there's only a living constable uh, protecting against burglary there, and she spends weeks and weeks trying to list first all the letters. We then move forward to 1936. Arthur Burrell, by now quite an elderly man, has obviously heard of the death of uh, and this, uh, John Lister, he lives down in London, sent a key of a code to Muriel Green's father, Edward Green, with a strict instruction that it was to be kept under lock and key. <laughs> so Muriel Green decided not to look at the diaries and the, their coded sections, but to write about the Anne Lister letters, and that's what she worked on, um, and how Anne Lister presented her respectable face and different faces for different correspondents. And I write about that in Presenting the Past in the uh, section, second section on letters. Uh, because local lesbian, a local lesbian with relationships to the elite families in Halifax, had all the potential still for local scandal. This silencing and what you might begin to call self-censorship went on, continued on into the 1950s and 60s. Uh, another member of the Halifax elite, Phyllis Ramsden, who was married to the editor of the Halifax Courier, the main paper then, began to work on um, uh, the, the diaries. Uh, as a member of the elite then, she was able to take copies of the diaries home and work on them, which a practice soon stopped um, by the new uh, archivist. Uh, everybody had to be treated equally. Uh, she worked on the travel, uh, wrote travel essays, and she was given access to the key to the code, Burrell's key to the code. Um, and she very usefully summarised the coded sections, which any of us who've worked on the diaries find incredibly uh, invaluable. Halifax, and indeed, very generally, national censorship of homosexuality continued right up to 1967. And in 1967, the Sexual Offences Act was passed in the UK, uh, referring to homosexual acts um, and making them legal. Um, but of course, it was only male acts uh, that were being criminalised, so it didn't directly affect women. But again, as a history and a culture of silencing, so the women we're talking about who are working on the analyst of diaries and letters, Muriel Green and Phyllis Ramsden, wrote nothing or at least published nothing on Anne Lister uh, living a lesbian life. I grew up in the 1950s and 60s. Anybody else had that experience? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you'll kind of come along with what I'm going to say. What I'm going to say is for the UK, it just wasn't ever mentioned. It just wasn't in my community, in my household. 1980, I moved to Halifax. It was a traditional, conservative, small C town. Feminism hadn't yet arrived, though we soon uh, changed that pretty differently. And it was definitely, very definitely, not a good place to be gay in. It was not a good place to be gay in, despite the fact that the uh, Sexual Offences Act had already been enacted and in law 13 years. Then uh, an article came out in The Guardian in 1984, two million word enigma, and ending up with the interview with Phyllis Ramsden May, and ending up and as the May well have been a lesbian. So beginning of a hint uh, out into the open. Phyllis Ramsden herself died in 1985, uh, so just the next year. And it seems to be that she destroyed her, any transcribed sections of the diary, coded diary she'd done. And there is suggestions now um, that these were actually um, burnt um, by, uh, on orders uh, of her, uh, to her descendants after her death. At the time, 1984, I'm busy teaching, and uh, I was working on a, a book about Greenham, if Greenham means anything to you. Yep. No. <laughs> Very good. Um, but I do visit Shipton because it's right on my doorstep. And then in 1988, out comes uh, Helene Whitbread's I Know My Own Heart. Um, it's now retitled uh, Secret Diaries 
Uh, and it had enormous public impact, particularly locally. Here was a local lesbian. Anne Lister talked in this book, uh, gave voice to freedoms for women that were still little dreamt of. And I introduced pages of this book, photocopies, into my Halifax classroom because I was teaching. I worked at uh, adult education at Leeds University and I was teaching, as I was asked to do, a new opportunities class in Halifax, which is a town that didn't have its own university, but we were offering access opportunities to women. And all my women students all exclaimed to a woman, we had no idea that that sort of thing went on around here. Nobody told us. <laughs> they, they were just absolutely gobsmacked. And I, I, was, I was fascinated. And I knew I just couldn't content myself with just this one book. So I went into the archives and I gradually added pages of the original diary to my teaching. Helena Whitbread's book looks at the early Anne Lister, 1817 to 24, very much a romantic. Anyone looked at it at all? One or two people. Uh, a romantic younger Anne Lister, her relationship very fraught with Marianna, who's married a man for conventional reasons. And my curiosity about Anne Lister was raising a child. She was sitting on my very own doorstep. I'm living down. Here. And I can practically see Shiddon Hall were it not for this um, hill. Um, so I go back into the archives in the Halifax Library to check. Has the Guardian got it right? Everyone knows the Guardian gets most things wrong. We used to, <laughs> we used to call it the Brownie Ad because it even misprinted its own name. <laughs> I mean, it's a wonderful paper, but misprints. Um, was, was it really two million words? Really? The diaries, the original diaries are, are, of course, very fragile, and the practice of lending them out to people, elite or not, has been, had been discontinued by a more professional archivist, of course. So I'm on microfilm. Anybody mature enough to run the microfilm? <laughs> <laughs> I'm calculating words per line, lines per page, page per volume, the different uh, numbers for handwritten sections and for coded sections. And whichever way I look at it, left or right, up or down, <coughs> I find it's four million words. So I retreat ashen face from the library. <laughs> Absolutely ashen face. This means it's three times the length of Samuel Pepys's diary, which everybody had thought was a really long diary. And I, need to, I needed time to recover. Uh, <laughs> and more, um, more pointedly, I needed a research strategy. What? What research strategy? Helena Whitbread had worked on the early Amnester, as we said, and she read, and she's quite open about saying through this, she read the coded sections first. And only then did she go back to Anderson's almost impossible to read handwriting. And I wondered, is that really necessarily the best way to un understand Anne Lister? So I, I began to look at the other editors, starting with John Lister, uh, Muriel Green, Phyllis Ramsden, and then Helena, and decided that the best way for me to understand it and to write about Anne Lister was to read her diaries as she wrote them as she wrote them, slipping effortlessly from handwriting sections to secret code, back from secret code to handwriting, hour by hour, and even changing in mid-sentence. And I wrote about that in, uh, in uh, Presenting the Past, which came out in, as an article in 1993, and then in this volume in 1994. And it shows a candid record of lesbian life. And what I decided to do then, because this had quite uh, some impact, as you can imagine, I decided to focus on the later Anne Lister, since Helena had worked on the earlier Anne Lister, from 1832 onwards. And in the 1990s, I spent long hours, often at the weekend, um, working on um, Anne Lister from 1832 to 1836. And the result was female fortune, 
which is my main and Lister book, uh, came out in 1998, and we just issued a new edition for Gentleman Jack with a new and I think quite significant uh, preface. So, after this, I went back, because this starts at the end of 1833, I decided to go back to 1832, which I'd only skimmed at in this book, and I wrote Nature's Domain, which tells the story for 1832 of Anne Lister's return to Shipton, betrayed, as we know, by yet one other uh, woman's marriage plans and meeting with Anne Walker and the Moss, Moss Hut show, stroke, show me a, and there's Nature's Domain, uh, came out in 2003, and again, we've just done our new edition, and uh, luckily with Nature's Domain and presenting the cars, if you like e-books, don't like paper, they're both in e-books. Uh, um, so let's return to our main theme, which is reading the Amnesty Diaries through the lens of LGBT history. This takes us to 1988. And the historical context, as Rachel and I will know, and there's nobody else from the UK here, is the no. Is that half a hand going up? <laughs> So you'll remember the election of Margaret Thatcher in 1972. <laughs> <laughs> Won't you? Um, or know of it um, in 1979. <laughs> um, Conservative, first woman prime minister, Conservative, and to the right of the Conservative Party. And one of the lesser known things that the Conservative government, Thatcher government, did was the 1990. 1988 Local Government Act, so she'd been in power for nine years. And what the Local Government Act did was to prohibit local authorities, like Calderdale, which ran Halifax, etc., etc., from promoting homosexuality. It prohibited local authorities, like Calderdale, Halifax, from promoting homosexuality. There were protests. And I'm just going to give you a tiny bit of vivid detail, if I may. May 1988, lesbian activists stormed the BBC News studios. <laughs> there was somebody called Sue Lordy, which was a household name then, reading the BBC News. She was midway through reading the six o'clock news when in stopped or stormed a whole number of gay women wearing t-shirts saying, stop the claws. They handcuffed themselves to the news desk. But the BBC decided not to press charges. The women were released and they went from the BBC newsroom to Parliament to join other protesters <coughs> there. Because what Section 28 did was bring a whole lot of people who'd perhaps been in different um, uh, styles, bring them together. Um, one thing I read was seeing queens brought together with political activists. So there's nothing like a common enemy or a common threat to bring people together. This uh, prohibiting of promoting homosexuality lasted until 2003. It lasted for 15 years, and it wasn't until well into a Labour government, anybody can remember Tony Blair and uh, Gordon Brown, till 2003. And this act, what effect did it have? It was mainly aimed at schools. It was mainly uh, aimed at uh, school teachers teaching in mainly secondary schools in uh, classrooms. But it also touched other local authority services, like museums, like Shipton Hall Museums. And people have often asked me, um, they've said to me, um, why was there so little about Anne Lister on the Shipton Hall display boards when we visited Halifax and Shipton Hall? Now you know, now you know, <laughs> there was a silent scene. Um, a legal silencing, um, and once again, a, a cultural silencing, backed by law, of uh, lesbian, uh, lesbianism. However, even the Local Government Act, even under Margaret Thatcher, could not censor book publishers. And, uh, <coughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, so, yeah, Female Fortune, Nature's Domain came out, uh, um, Virago's uh, Helena Whitbread book, and thankful, thankfully we have an independent press 
who wasn't going to be cow-towed by, in this case, Thatcherism. So from 2003 onwards, a more tolerant, open uh, era was ushered in with new approaches to lesbian history. For example, the suggestion, uh, controversial, doubtful, that she was the first Mormon lesbian. And then we jump forward to 2010. I don't know whether anybody watched uh, The Secret Life by Lister. Uh, I don't think uh, one or two, uh, a small show of hands. I don't know how much it came over to the States. With Maxine Peake, who's a wonderful actress, playing, albeit Brock Long, playing Alice. <laughs> and it was mainly on uh, early Alice. Um, and then almost more importantly, um, in 2011, the diaries were inscribed in the UNESCO Memory of the World Register for the UK. It was inscribed in the UNESCO Memory of the World Register for the UK. Real global recognition. And there were only three such UK diarists there, recognised by UNESCO. There was Samuel Pepys, the great diarist, John Evelyn, slightly less well known, and now Anne Lister, the phony woman up there. But there was not, as yet, a major drama series about this wonderfully complex woman. <laughs> And the writer who would bring the full analyst to our screens is, of course, the genius scriptwriter Sally Wainwright. I first met her in 2001. A mutual friend gave her a copy of Female Fortune, and that's the book which inspired Sally to start writing about Anne We did a quite a bit of work together, walking around Shibden, emails, phone calls, meetings, everything. <coughs> It was hard and exciting work, but nobody was really accepting it. Sally wasn't as yet uh, well known and established as a screenwriter. And we had to go our separate ways, me back to uh, adult education. And Sally went on to write Scott and Bailey. Anyone watched it? Ooh. Yes! Yeah. <laughs> She went on to write Last Hang Hang Tango in Halifax. And yes. seen it? Yes. yes! And then the last one I'm going to ask you to wave your hands at is Happy Valley. Yes. 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 So, <laughs> well, I'm glad for the excitement. <laughs> she is a complete genius. Um, and to cut a complex story very short, what it meant was that by 2016, around 2016, Sally Wainwright had established herself as a very successful and award-winning scriptwriter for television. So when she went back to the BBC, and this is around mid-2016, and said, how about it? They said, when would you like it, Sally? And they said, oh, well, go away. <laughs> So again, we spent um, some hectic months together at Shibden, working on scripts with a production company, and then and I working as historical advisor, and then as it got nearer to filming and other scripts, uh, another uh, history advisor took over and I went back to other things. So let's jump forward to um, filming of Gentleman Jack, mainly at Shibden, but also other Halifax and West Riding venues. And this summer, our first show in the uh, United States, uh, April, and then it started in UK in May. And I think so many people have watched a bit of it. What a lot of publicity. I knew it was <laughs> going down a lot of publicity. But even before, it, I think it started in the UK, my niece, Georgia, who Joe knows, um, was changing tube chains at Oxford Circus. Can you see it says Oxford Circus? And suddenly went, oh my goodness, she went to the BBC, Gentleman Jack on the tube, enormous. Um, so that's just a symbol, uh, a su suggestion of how much publicity there was. Because now it wasn't just BBC, it was HBO. Uh, I've never seen so much publicity, and with it, over the last year or so, there have been a number of tie-in books. Um, um, we can talk later about the two Gentleman Jack um, books as, as well in the Q&A, and the very successful um, Halifax Minster uh, weekend. I don't think anybody probably was there apart from Richard Lee. Um, which was just fantastic. So 
Let's end with our question. Um, how do you write about a woman who has already written four to five million words? We've looked at how authors and editors from 1872 through to 2019, nearly 150 years, and I'm sorry if it seemed rather a fast counter. Uh, we've looked at how Anne Lister has been presented by these writers and editors through the lens of LGBT history and changing lens. And I think we do need to recognise and acknowledge the historical context, the changing legal context for LGBT presentations during this century and a half. 1885, the Criminal Law Amendment Act, men. 1921, the proposed amendment to it, women. 18... 1988 to 2003, Section 28, 15 whole years when promoting uh, homosexuality was, pro was prohibited in local authorities. So I leave you with this question. Was it easier to live a lesbian life if you were a member of the landed gentry or a member of the elite, as our vista was, in the 1830s than it could be a century later? say the 1930s, or till 2013, just 16 years ago when the act, uh, or that section of it was repealed. And maybe for the LGBT community, and maybe especially for women, it hasn't all been smooth progress. I'm going to end it there with that question. Thank you. <laughs>
it's um, a, a very complex form of will making, but that's what the aristocracy and gentry did. So they, they were fairly um, in, in a pattern with that. Any other questions that are, uh, yeah. So did you find the film Gentleman Jack to accurately reflect what you read in the journals? And did she storm around like she does in the movie? <laughs> like, I love it when she's busting out of the carriage and knocking, the, like, I mean, or is that just like made up? Well, what inevitably you will find with a script writer and, and somebody um, as talented as Sally Wainwright and given such a wide brief, you know, the first series is eight hours and we're waiting for the second series, is of course she has a certain amount of dramatic license. <laughs> of course she has. And a number of people have asked me about pigs. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, and anyone who should like this cemetery, uh, graveyard, um, the guy who was supposed to die by being eaten by pigs, he, do, he's, he lived to quite a ripe old age. <laughs> Next time we go to Halifax and go up to Lightfoot Graveyard, which is where Amorka is buried, you can see that he lived to a ripe old age. So of course there is a um, dramatic license. Of course there is, because my work sits flat on the page, and I was just always amazed how Sally turned something that's flat on the page into something that could grip the attention and, and infuse people around the world. Um, what was the other bit of your question? But did, did she, oh, did, did the way she was... Walking, walking. She was a fast walker. <laughs> <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't tracked this in scientific detail, but I've tracked some of the routes she walked along the canal, so it's fairly flat, and the canal came to Halifax, as you probably know, in 1828. So the canal uh, skirts around the lowland. And she roughly walked at four miles an hour. Anyone here can walk for an hour at four miles an hour? Right, next question, can anyone here walk for a few hours at four miles an hour? You can't. So she wasn't, and she wasn't particularly tall, so she walked really, really fast. And I think, you know, the drama, that's given a certain amount of uh, jiggle. Any other questions? <laughs> uh, so pass and answer the question, ask the question. Yeah, at the back. Do stand up. And... Hi, I'm Anna. Um, I have a question. Uh, reading her diaries, how can you determine that what she's written is actual fact and events other than the newspaper events backing that up? And what is pure fantasy on her part? Mm. Well, that's an interesting question. Mm. Now, what is real? <laughs> <laughs> what is real? What is fact? Um, obviously, with the sort of, uh, you know, what Anne Walker and Anne Lister did in bed, you know, it's very difficult to find corroborative evidence. <laughs> <laughs> years and years and really come to nothing very much. But, so let's look at something that was rather more public and would be in the newspapers and that's say elections. Um, and there you get, you know, Anne Lister wasn't writing for a mass public, she was writing <coughs> for uh, the record and it's pretty accurate. You know, I look at the polling books for the 1835 election and when she says I doorstepped um, her small tenant um, at the top of uh, the hill above Halifax and told him to vote Tory, told him to vote for his land ladies, landowner's interests, and told him to vote for the Tory Conservative interest. You see, he did. Mm -hmm. It's fairly accurate. I haven't found anything that's inaccurate. What you do find in, say, the letters, and a lot of the letters are then copied into the diaries, is she's presenting different faces of herself to her correspondence. So for example, to Lady Stewart, who's the mother of the Tory candidate in Halifax, in the Halifax constituency. Oh dear Lady Stewart, um, I'm so pleased to have, hear from you. How delightful, how delightful. I'm hoping to be able to help your son in whatever way I can. Um, and she rather builds herself up to be a bit of a power broker on behalf of Lady Stewart's son, the Tory candidate. Well, in fact, she wasn't. 
um, she, the number of tenancies she had in Halifax who were voting tenancies who actually had the vote was probably about four, you know, it was, it was peanuts. But you don't say that in the letter, you build yourself up. And likewise, the letters that she wrote to Anne Walker's relatives. Um, and she's very much disguising uh, the truth of her relationship, her real relationship with Anne Walker. And can we blame her? So I've managed to not answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> and who else? Yeah. Oh. If you'd like to stand up so everyone can hear. Sure. People write diaries for all kinds of reasons now as well as in the past. Um, you, you, are, you are highlighting the um, unusual length of these diaries and, of course, and Lister's unusual life in many respects. Do you, do you see those as connected? Like, do you have a, a sort of a psychological theory of why it is that she wrote such lengthy diaries and whether she essentially saw herself as the highly unusual person that we're now seeing her as being for that time. Yes, that's an interesting question because the diaries didn't start off as being very lengthy. I've shown you a couple of pages, uh, 1832, 1834, and you can see that each daily entry is quite long, quite lengthy. It didn't start off like that. It started off in 1806 when she was 15 and she just left the manor school in York, an elite girls boarding school. And the first line is, Eliza left us yesterday. Eliza, her first lover, who had been a pupil also at the Manor School, who'd come to visit the Lister family, and Anne Lister was then living in um, Halifax Town. She hadn't yet moved up to Shipton. And it starts off as a schoolgirl diary um, in a very schoolgirl handwriting, one line per page. So it starts off with, this is my unusual relationship with uh, a school, a fellow school pupil, and I'm missing her. And an exchange of gifts with Eliza and um, Anne. Then, as she moves up to Shibden, um, a decade or so later, and goes to live with the more elite section of the Lister family, her aunt Anne and uncle James, the diaries lengthen. And then after she's inherited Shipton Hall and the death of Uncle James in 1826, they further lengthen. And then when she returns from her travels, and I haven't said a thing about Paris, but her stay in Paris is pretty interesting, <laughs> and the silence and everything, <coughs> and relationships. Um, when she returns to Shipton and decides to reinvent herself as a serious, powerful member of the local landed gentry from um, May 1832 onwards, the diaries further lengthen still. And the, the, each entry gets longer and longer. And when I first started reading these 1832 diaries, I thought, oh my goodness, I don't think I can read another line about um, sort of work on the estate, etc., etc. It's just so boring. But I gradually got into it and understand, <laughs> understand what she was doing. She was reinventing herself. And for example, once Anne Walker comes, and this is not going away from the question you asked, Sonny, once Anne Walker comes to live at Shipton in autumn 1834, and after the marriage ceremony at Goodrum Gate in York at Easter 1834, and this begins, begins to have more ready access to Anne Walker's income stream. Mm -hmm. So she can begin to improve Shipton and the improvements at Shipton. When you visit Shipton, and please do, please come, um, <laughs> you'll see it rather different from the, um, what, what, what was uh, in the drawing I showed you from 1835. She wasn't really getting going until 1836 with the grand improvements. So the diary enlarges as Anne's seriousness about herself. But of course, the sexual relationships throughout, they're right there in the first line, and they're right there to the very, very end, and they're in the coded sections. Um, and that's what people has gripped people. Um, but I will stick to what I say, that in order to be able to understand how Anne Lister did all she did, uh, we have to read the, the handwritten sections because that shows what sort of power she had. For example, you're a local doctor in Halifax 
and uh, you're being asked to come up to Shibden Hall and sort out some illness of, say, Aunt Anne, who's got a gouty leg. You're utterly dependent on this family at Shibden. And do you remember Anne List at one point, uh, this is when she's come back in late 1833, and she gets the doctor like that, do you remember? Yeah. Now, we don't usually do that with doctors. Might <laughs> <laughs> be tempted, but we, we resist. She could do that with a doctor because a doctor, a lawyer, a surveyor, they were professionals who utterly depended on their, for much of their income and their wherewithal on um, Anne Lister and um, estates like Shifton Hall. Is there a, any other questions from anybody else? Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could say more about her relationship with her family, particularly her parents and her sister, and if they knew about the relationships that were going on with other women, and if so, how was that received? Um, bad. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't get on with her family at all well. Um, if you read Nature's Domain and Female Fortune, you can see how badly she got on with her sister Marianne, who was, a, um, who was the younger sister. Because what, why was Marianne such a threat? Why was Marianne such a threat to our listener? I mean, really, she, she, was a she could marry and have a child. She could marry and have a child, and it could be a male child, and it could inherit. And um, people say, well, could she really? Our Uncle James's will says, all you need to think is you're a clever lawyer, and you've been hired by Marianne Lister and her now husband to contest this in the court and you can paint Anne Lister as a very dubious character. And Anne Lister had to get rid of Marianne. She had to be banished, and she was banished, away from Shipton Hall, back to a very minor part of the Lister estate, which was out, out in the East Riding of, um, of uh, uh, Yorkshire. Her parents she didn't reckon, that, not reckon much by. Her mother died early and had a bit of a drink problem. Her father was a shuffling old soldier, um, Timothy West is presented as rather affectionate character in Gentleman Jack. Um, I, I, I see him as not quite so lovable. So and she had two brothers, and particularly, uh, she had four brothers, two died in infancy. John died in, as a teenager, and her surviving brother Sam became an ensign in the, in the army. And she was really fond of Sam and they corresponded with each other of how to endear themselves to Aunt Anne and Uncle James up at Shipton Hall, which is the grand part of the Lister estate. And then Sam died in Ireland as an ensign in the army, and, and Lister was left with just a really pathetic sister Marion. <laughs> <laughs> so the only member of the family she really loved, this is portrayed, I think Sally does it so well in the, in the drama, is her relationship with her Aunt Anne. Mm -hmm. Now, Aunt Anne understood and loved Anne Lister. Anne Lister was the daughter she'd never had. And I, I, don't, I think it probably, Aunt Anne didn't think in, ter in terms of a sexual relationship. What she thought about in terms of, say, Anne Walker, was that this was a suitable partnership for her unusual niece, Anne. I don't think we can put it further than that. And she loved whatever Anne did. Well, she supported whatever Anne did. And she really was a major support for Anne. And Anne had very good relationships with older, older women, as you'll see in Female Fortune and Nature's Domain. A couple of other questions that people put in their hands up. Yes? I was just curious. Back in the day, because I'm a little ignorant on this, what would be the punishment if she was found out? What so, they, the punishment, legal punishment for, for what? For being a lesbian? What's that? <laughs> 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 so there was no word lesbian. There was right. no, you know, women <coughs> were asexual. Um, there was no, what, all right, what, there was the punishment, if you mean in law, but there could be shunning. Okay, yeah. There could be shunning. And if you read Female Fortune, or there's a little bit in Gentleman Jack, Mrs. Priestley, I mean, nothing like the cold shoulder, the term cold shoulder, um, which you see in Gentleman Jack with Mrs. Priestley and, and others. The shunning, the cold shoulder, and the mocking. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be very interested to see in um, 
series two, whether some of the more dramatic of the mocking gets into the um, script for series two, if it covers sort of 1834, which is the marriage, through to the uh, female fortune ends in May 1836, so it's um, just over two years. The most dramatic, and I'm just going to um, not give you the whole story, but just whet your appetite so you can read it in female fortune. Uh, if the story is complex and long, um, but for complex reasons, Anne Lister and Anne Walker, down in Halifax, so way down out of sight of Shipton, are burnt in effigy. And that's the worst thing you can do to anybody but stay just about the the law. So I've looked at effigy burning in Halifax um, previously, uh, prior to this, and you know the Great Reform Act, I'm sure Darcy's told you about the Great Reform Act and the controversy over giving more men the vote, 1832. Uh, this was opposed by the Duke of Wellington, who was then the uh, leader, the Prime Minister of the Conservatives, the Tories. And there was a lot of enthusiasm for enlarging the electorate and, and, and cleaning up the, uh, the political system. And Wellington was blocking it. And so what you do, somebody's blocking the reforms you want, you make an effigy, you build an effigy of him, you carry it through Halifax, and then you set fire to him on the bonfire. Uh -huh. I don't think Halifax was the only place that did it. I'm sure, you know, the word went around, just burn Wellington in effigy, and that's all you need for him to get the word. And the act went through under Lord Grey, leader of the Whigs. And uh, you know Bramwell Bronte, um, the, the, the brother of the sister Brontes? Um, he was also a Tory. He lived nearby in the West Riding of Yorkshire. He was up in uh, Haworth, which is about 10 miles from... Uh, Halifax, that's all. And he again was supporting the Tory interest. Um, and he got burnt in effigy uh, in, in, in Haworth. So it wasn't so unusual, but what's interesting here is two, two women being burnt in effigy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an attack on their uh, lesbianism. It was, I think, using their lesbianism as a way, you know, two women together to uh, warn them of their industrial um, entrepreneurial activity in the coal industry. Because with the coming of the canals to Halifax in 1828, coal was in heavy demand, mills were going up, textile mills were going up. So yes, do have a read in female fortune. And there's other things as well. Mock marriage announcements. I'm Great just going to wait your time with that. Have a good time with another, <laughs> another question. Yeah. Um, so you've mentioned that only recently, really, perhaps in the past 40 years or so, have the coded elements of her diaries um, been published and gone into detail about the um, relationship that she had with Walker. But even before, perhaps, um, her lesbian relationships were circulated um, more in a mainstream, uh, I guess, context. Was there already discussion either in academic circles or in LGBT circles in the UK of the fact that she was a lesbian? Well, let me just take you back to your, your first statement because um, the first publication um, that was quite clearly based on both the codes, or well, largely the coded sections of the diary, was Helena Whitworth's I Know My Own Heart in 1988. It, oh, so a little bit. Uh, yeah, going back years. Yes. <laughs> and then uh, Nature's Domain, likewise, 1994, Female Fortune, mm -hmm. sorry, that's wrong, uh, Female Fortune in, in 1998. So it's been established for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, so are you saying was... Perhaps like early 20th century, or is it once you sort of hit I guess the middle where you have. I think uh, it, until Helena Whitbread's work was published by Virago, um, it wasn't known outside antiquarian circles or Halifax yes. circles. All right. I would say that's fair to say. Um, have you come across a historian called E.P. Thompson? Uh, yes. 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 Yeah, maybe, <laughs> yes. maybe you think he's working class. <laughs> yeah. Well, as it happens, E.P. Thompson. <coughs> 
lived in Halifax and wrote The Making of the English Working Class, one of the best known books of the late 20th century for UK history in Halifax. And uh, even after they moved, he and his wife Dorothy had moved away, um, they, well, they'd written on uh, and Lister, but it, it hadn't really been published. The, a, transcript, a typescript's in the library. But <coughs> in, do you remember I mentioned the Guardian article in 1984? That was an interview, not just with Phyllis Ramsden, um, who worked on it, uh, wife of the Halifax editor, but also with Dorothy Thompson, who was then a lecturer, and I think senior lecturer in history at Birmingham University, and had begun working through a research assistant uh, on the Anlister Diaries at exactly the same time as Helena Whitbread was working on it. And it was just very sad that they were both working uh, on the same parts, section of the diary, i.e. the early Anlister Diaries, at the same time. Um, and Virago had only published one book, and they published um, Helene Whitbread's. And so uh, Dorothy Thompson's transcripts were never published. I think that's fair to say. They were never published, which was very hard um, on both her and her research assistant. So in certain academic circles, but we are talking quite limited academic circles, uh, and this might be known um, before 1988, where she'd be known widely, uh, more widely, was in, in terms of politics, writing about the elections, um, social life, etc., etc., because of what John Lister had published um, in the 1880s, up to about 1892, when he stopped. So it was pretty narrow until 1988, pretty limited in terms of... Have we got time for a final question? Was that a final person? Yeah. Um, I was wondering about like the way that she like understood her own identity. Did she like see it as more of her and her personal relationships? Did she have awareness or like any sense of community with queer people in other parts of the UK or in Europe? Yep. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, Anne Lister's circle, I mean, given that the word lesbian was not known, was not used, or the concept, Anne Lister's um, circle who understood what she was about was an elite female circle. It, uh, one or two elite families in Halifax, but particularly in York, the capital uh, city for Yorkshire, and London, <coughs> and Paris, and when she got there, Moscow. Um, but it was very, uh, very sort of small, and it often was spoken spoken in code. So the code would be, um, you refer to wintering in Rome, which elite women did, because, I mean, you've seen the Halifax climate. <laughs> <laughs> it's just terrible. It's cold and smith. <laughs> um, so wintering in Rome was something elite women could hope. And what is crucial to understand that Lister is her staunch Anglicanism, her staunch faith in uh, a, a Protestant God um, and in the Church of England and within the Church of England, the Anglicans, within the more right-wing and less reforming um, sections of the Anglicanism, Anglican Church. And that was very important. And when she was saying cementing her relationship with Anne Walker, the sort of things that Anne Lister would give Anne Walker, and the sort of and any anthropologist here will know that gift, the symbolism of gifts, gift exchange, um, she gave her, and her specially bound in gilt leather and um, little, little leather and something else that was special, gold, um, a special prayer book uh, of prayers for family prayers. And, and Mr. Anne Walker read prayers every Sunday and the appropriate prayers and sermons. And they read them every Sunday at Shipton. Religion was crucial to underpinning her confidence in herself as a lesbian and living a lesbian life. Mm. Can we take one more question from the very back? I saw a sad face. Is <laughs> <laughs> there a question that's Jerry back? It was you. No? Okay. All right. I can see it. Thank you so much. Join me.
pleasure to come and speak at Smith's. I've really enjoyed it. And thank you for being such a brilliant audience. Thank you. 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 Thank you.